Congratulations and welcome to the Hyperlinked Library MOOC. Uh, this module is Learning and New Literacies, and I am honored, honored to be talking with Char Booth today. Uh, Char is the Instructional Services Manager and e-learning librarian at Claremont Colleges Library, and she is an ACRL Immersion Institute faculty member. How cool is that? She is the author of this book, Which Rocks My World, Reflective Teaching and Effective Learning. If you are doing anything with instruction in libraries, this is the book to have, and that's a commercial I wanted to do. I use this in my class, uh, Transformative Learning and Technology Literacies, and it has been so well received by my students. Um, Char is going to talk to us today about learning and some of our topics, and I am just knocked out that she is here. Char, welcome. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I love kind of doing things with Michael because he gives you these introductions that make you feel really good about yourself. So um, I, I really appreciate that. That's great. And um, I worked super hard on that book and really poured my heart into it. So I'm glad that um, you appreciate it. So what I'm going to do today is um, talk some about the kind of like teaching and learning aspects of librarianship and how I see them developing and how I think um, kind of our profession is, is starting to trend more towards pedagogy in general. And I believe that um, Michael's also going to record another section for the MOOC that, that talks a lot about um, the emerging literacies that are that are happening and there's um, really a lot of discussion of those in the profession. So I'm going to kind of shore up the, the very basic teaching and learning stuff and then Michael will come at the other um, at the other side. So I've got a slide deck, and I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen, turn this on, so bear with me for one second. And we should have connection. Michael, do you see my slides? I do. Perfect. All right, so um, here we go. The very, very simple title of my MOOC portion is Libraries and Learning, and that's my Twitter handle. Should you um, choose to do something with it, you're far, well, very welcome to. Right, so um, I'm going to take about 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, to talk through the contents that I've prepared for today, and then Michael and I will have a bit of discussion afterwards. Um, so what I'm going to try to do really is cover three core topics and three core concepts. And um, I've noticed that over the course of my career, pretty much everything comes down to threes, which I think is a very good pedagogical strategy in general. To give people too much information, they will not remember it, they will not take it away, and they will become irritated um, with you, and that's pretty much the last thing you ever want to do to someone you're trying to um, instruct or engage in a learning experience with. So I've limited myself to three concepts, um, and those are going to be broadly stated, library teaching and learning, the idea of instructional literacy, or basically what um, what I think library professionals, information professionals can do to shore up the different types of um, pedagogical strategies or um, or kind of understandings that they themselves need to kind of succeed in in um, in the arena of libraries and teaching and learning. So that's that's something I'll talk about in the middle. And then finally, um, everyone's super excited to know that I'll be talking about learning theory, which is one of my own. Um, personal poisons, and I think is actually very fascinating to think about how um, libraries and information-oriented organizations really intersect with this idea of how people learn and why people learn and what in the world we can do to help them learn. Um, so without further ado, uh, those are the three things I'm going to cover today, and I'll take them one by one. And I'm going to do so, I'm just going to warn you now, with kind of a broad brush. So um, hopefully that graphic communicates that this is a, a, a kind of a very skirting over the surface approach to these things, but one that I hope will give um, all participants a perspective on where this stuff is in our profession. So um, that's the that's where we're going to do it. And here I'm getting started with library teaching and learning, so kind of an overview of the state of things as I see it. Um, the overarching message that I want people to take away from this presentation, or really kind of chew on, or mull over, or whatever you want to do with it. Um, is the fact, I think, that libraries have always been learning-oriented organizations and librarians themselves uh, have always been learning facilitators. Uh, so what I mean by that is the, the very role and function of the library has always been to consolidate knowledge, to make it available to people, and to help people autodidact, to help people learn, um, learn about things that they're interested in to help people teach themselves and become independent in their own inquiry, which I think is the end-all, be-all of all um, kind of approaches to teaching and learning is to 
empower people to control their own learning um, kind of trajectory. So that is the reason libraries exist. Um, in the past, we have tried to mold people into the learners or the citizens that we want them to be, but I like to think that um, we're a much more kind of progressive and democratically oriented bunch now who really let people find their own path um, towards what they're trying to understand. And as uh, learning facilitators, librarians, again, provide access. Um, we try to stimulate people's interest in um, whatever topics that they're, that they're um, going after and hoping to learn about. And the organizations that we construct and maintain have multiple pathways uh, to learning kind of within them. And that's developing all the time. And that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is that the ways libraries help people learn, uh, whether you be public, special, uh, academic, school media specialist, we are developing more and more ways um, for learning to occur within our facilities online um, and interpersonally. So I think that's really wonderful. And I do just want to mention that um, this is by no means like new development in library land. Uh, for a long time, K through 12 kind of school media specialists have had a lot of specialization in in education, but the rest of us are, are very much catching up with them now, I think. Right, so I wanted to set out two things along this kind of spectrum or ruler of libraries and learning. And the first thing that I want to discuss are the roles that I think we are kind of um, developing into in terms of this idea of librarian as educator, librarian as teacher, and libraries as learning uh, spaces. So increasingly, I see my colleagues and people getting into the field becoming um, much more design oriented. Um, they're becoming more conversant with different types of instructional technologies. They're learning how to advocate for their new roles and bring new collaborators into their spaces uh, to kind of redefine the understanding of what librarians do. We're becoming developers of um, new technologies, of new learning spaces, and again, um, helping people autodidact, how, helping people learn for themselves and also never stopping doing this ourselves. So uh, librarians who want to be educators and who want to be teaching and learning focused really need to never stop learning. Um, if you do, you're going to get kind of obsolesced pretty quickly. I mentioned collaboration already. But also, um, in this day and age, and the way that our profession is changing, um, you really do have to be an uh, innovative thinker, someone who can really think around corners and develop new modes and new ways of working. Um, and that all gets down to this idea of catalyzing um, new collaborations, catalyzing new ways of uh, reaching people. And the skills that take uh, it takes to get there, as I see it, are an understanding of the concept of pedagogy. Um, how do you teach? What's your own kind of teaching philosophy? What's your orientation to helping people learn? Um, are you able to, again, assess, and this is a very important part of this and something I'm going to talk about in a little more detail soon, uh, can you show that the people you're trying to uh, engage in a learning experience with have taken anything away from it? Can you assess the impact of your own efforts? Um, then curation, planning, and communication. Again, this is all this kind of strategic thinking around um, the work of libraries and developing um, new pathways to learning and new types of experiences for people to engage in. And then the final three are just kind of my own um, favorite skills for everyone to have in the entire world. Flexibility, practicality, and moxie. So um, a lot of the skill set that comes along with developing new roles in any traditional profession, we're pretty, we're pretty locked in in some ways, um, are, you know, are these three things. So seeing the opportunities that are ahead of you, being flexible enough, and having enough moxie or kind of chutzpah or whatever you want to say uh, to bring new things off. And now I'm going to give a couple of examples um, for how I really see this developing role Again, the combination of, um, of roles and skills that I talked about in these last few slides really, really coming to pass. And now, my own um, working arena is in higher education. And I'm aware that a lot of the people who are participating in this MOOC uh, may not be working in higher ed. But I did want to give the caveat that I am by no means only talking to people who work in academic libraries and such like. Uh, but a lot of the examples that I'm going to talk about do come from that context because it's the one that I work in and the one I'm most familiar with. Um, so I'm not trying to be an academic library supremacist or anything. Um, just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> All right, so one of the library blogs that I really like, and um, one that's written and maintained by my good friend and collaborator, Brian Matthews, who's a pretty visionary guy, is the ubiquitous librarian. Now, um, he wrote a blog post actually yesterday that set up a really good example for uh, this MOOC talk, if you will. 
So it's called Curating Learning Experiences, A Future Role for Librarians. Um, now, what he talks about in this post is really quite simple. He had a faculty member at his university, which is Virginia Tech, basically request a customized WordPress theme for a course because the learning management system wasn't working out for them. They really wanted their students to be able to um, do some different things. Now, um, what Brian said was, well, you know, I could have turned around and said, uh, no, that's not my job. That's not what the library does. I've never done this before, so you need to go elsewhere. You need to go to campus IT or something. But instead, um, he used his moxie and practicality to say, Actually, yeah, totally. Um, I'll buy that for you. I'll help you out with this. Um, maybe this can give a good proof of concept for something else my organization can develop into. Now, um, in this sense, Brian is acting like an instructional designer. He's acting entrepreneurially. He's thinking creatively. And he's satisfying you know, a collaborator that will, in the future, understand that the library can be counted on right, to facilitate new, different types of learning experiences and instruction. So I really like this post, and I, I encourage people to go out and check it out. Um, Brian, in unfailingly, writes about things that I think are thought-provoking, and so if you take something away from this, um, do do check that blog out. Also, um, so on a more formal level, if you're looking at libraries in higher ed, um, kind of teaching and learning in that arena, we are so much more focused now on um, the learning experience of um, of the people who are part of our organizations, right? So. If higher ed is increasingly focused on outcomes-based education, now this is something that K through 12 has been uh, very much, very much on the page with for many, many years. But but there's becoming a lot more formalized kind of evaluation and assessment built into both academic libraries and just higher ed in general. And let me tell you, um, half of my job is about assessment, and half of my job is about uh, both proving the value of my institution and proving the value of my institution in terms of student learning. And I can't, um, I can't stress this enough, that any type of teaching, any type of education, it's not about the educator really at all. It's about the learner um, and what that educator can do for the learner, in, in a sense. So it's a relationship, but it's very much focused on um, the end product, that end learning experience. So the reason I show this report is because it's a, a wonderful kind of, um, kind of benchmark litmus test for people who are getting into a higher ed libraries to really understand how um, the value proposition is addressed in terms of teaching and learning and a lot of other metrics. So um, this is also kind of spearheaded by a collaborator of mine who's a very smart individual, um, Dr. Megan Oakleaf at Syracuse University. And again, if you're getting into higher ed or interested in how um, this kind of evaluation assessment value building exercise is going, I would very much recommend that you check that out. It's just free online through ACRL. OK, so I'm going to shift gears now. And I'm going to talk about a few examples that are a little closer to home. Now, remember, I'm, I'm kind of giving an overview of what I see as the state of teaching and learning in libraries. And I mean, that's, a, that's a really big task. But um, I'm going to kind of narrow down now to my own institution. And I work for a pretty unique place called uh, the Claremont Colleges. And what it is is seven different private institutions that kind of work together to form a consortium. And it's a very unique place. And what it does is it gives uh, my library system, which is just one library in the middle of all these campuses, the ability to be super creative um, with how we approach instruction and how we approach teaching and learning. Because we don't have a lot of people, and we have to reach seven different colleges with their own curriculum and learning cultures and all this stuff. So it's like kind of the funnest challenge ever. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you our definition of information literacy right now is because I think it, um, it really illustrates something about customization and context. So I think one of the things that uh, kind of the, the state of teaching and, library, uh, teaching and learning in libraries right now tells us is that contextual um, uh, really focusing on what a given organization or given user population needs is, is critically important. So it's always great to share template learning materials, to share strategies to, to kind of for the profession to talk to itself and understand itself on a big picture, but also when you're on the ground and with, when you're working with a specific population, you have to understand what they need um, you know, themselves and the characteristics of that learner community. It's, it's critical. Um, so what you're looking at is the information liter literacy definition that my colleagues and I came up with over the last few years that we're going to basically ask all of our colleges to adopt formally. Uh, so the library, in this sense, is funneling out a definition of a, a particular literacy, I would say the most established literacy that our field um, has had working for it for the last, I'd say, 35 years. And uh, Michael, again, will get into some of the other emerging literacies uh, that you can definitely talk about in 
in tandem with and, um, and even uh, in opposition to sometimes information literacy. Now, I'm showing this because uh, what we did was we took the ACRL definition of information literacy and tweaked it a lot for the learners that we have at the Claremont Colleges. Um, these are highly selective private schools. Uh, the, the students there have a lot more kind of uh, readiness, I think, than, than a, lot of other, a lot of other institutions, and that's something that we acknowledge, and um, critical thinking and communication is very highly valued at our, at our institutions. So we really privilege those things. Um, we also pulled out the idea of attribution as a very central skill that a lot of today's learners who are coming into college really don't um, understand in the way that um, they're expected to. Right. So Moving right along, now talking again about the evaluation and assessment angle of teaching and learning in libraries. Now, my department does a lot of that kind of traditional library instruction where we work with a given class, you know, teach a couple workshops, do different things. We're also very much um, merging into new areas such as assignment design consultation, working with the campus's assessment folks to actually, um, again, prove that learning is happening among students and helping them work towards accreditation. And accreditation, as you know, is kind of the holy grail of, of all higher education. You have to be accredited in order to grant degrees that people care about. So whenever a library can uh, become part of that conversation on their campus, it is a very good thing. Right, so and now here we have um, the 2013-14 version of our information literacy instructional rubric. Now, this is a thing that we can give to faculty, we can give to uh, campuses accreditation officers to basically evaluate the end product of student work. One of the problems that's happened in the library profession over kind of the, the previous years is that we often will kind of intersect with learners in a midstream way. So go into class, teach a couple workshops, and then never see what the students come up with in the end. Now, this object right here is meant to kind of fix that. So here we are, we say, all right, so your students are writing a research paper or a thesis or, you know, creating a film. Well, We'll work with you to take this rubric and prove that you know they have acquired some sort of information literacy skills, or prove that they haven't, and then go back and, and remediate um, those skills. So I, I give this kind of example because if we're talking about using um, instruction, using teaching and learning to prove library value, here's a slide uh, from a presentation that some colleagues and I recently gave at a staff meeting at Claremont, and this is something that we're going to be um, writing about and kind of publishing. Um, publishing really soon, so um, sneak peek at this. What we did, there's an assessment and action project that ACRL is running right now, and this is 75 institutions uh, where libraries basically create a research design and try to, um, again, demonstrate the impact of their efforts on student learning. So there are a lot of kind of charts and numbers and graphs on this slide, but um, if I'll just direct your attention down to the below um, bar charts around attribution, evaluation, communication. So what we did is we took 100 papers from Pitsa College, uh, their first year seminar course, and we used the rubric to score them. And we coded our, um, our kind of involvement with those classes, because we, we taught information literacy workshops for pretty much all of them, um, uh, on a scale of kind of extremely high to extremely low, both in terms of how the librarian worked with a faculty member on their syllabus, and also um, how much instruction they delivered, and whether students kind of engaged in this online tutorial. So what we found uh, when we evaluate these 100 papers is that um, the more the librarians worked with the students, the better they did in terms of information literacy in their final work. Now, this is extremely validating and wonderful data to have because not only does it show that students are learning as a result of our efforts, but it's showing our faculty that collaborating with us is actually um, a very good thing in terms of uh, the skill set that their students will build. So I build this in um, and I include this. Not to say how you know rad the Claremont colleges are, even though we're, we're doing some pretty great stuff. I include this to demonstrate that it's not just getting in front of a group of people and telling them stuff. It's making sure that you have um, kind of conducted a successful intervention, if you will, um, and that is definitely teaching and learning speak right there. But that's okay. So moving right along, a couple of other things that we're doing at Claremont that get a little bit more towards the creative side of of what I think is happening with pedagogy and libraries. So um, thinking about libraries as kind of a bird's eye view on a learning community and the kind of the locus of understanding, if you will, for a given institution, a given community, this is a visual curriculum mapping project that um, is actually grant funded through IMLS. We, we um, at Claremont won a Sparks grant for 2013 to map our entire curriculum using concept mapping software. And the reason why we're doing this is to build connections between our colleges 
to understand how the library can support um, kind of uh, education focused collections, learning more about our faculty community, learning more about pretty much everything that goes on at our institutions. If you're going to be a librarian that focuses on education, you have to again understand your community. You can't just expect them um, to understand you and care about what you're up to. We're also really uh, focusing on the idea of open access. And open access and uh, kind of the, <laughs> the literacy of what goes online, how it's published, who has access to it, all of these things um, are, I think, becoming more and more important to what we think of as information literacy or digital literacy. This is a screenshot of Claremont's institutional repository. And we're working with different programs to take that capstone or the senior thesis work that students produce and actually you know, put it up online, not only put it up, but teach students what it means to be an author, teach students what it means to be a published author, right? So they have all of these um, increased responsibilities around proper attribution, around these rigorous academics um, when they do this. And it's, we find that it is a fabulous way of engaging people kind of to the, to the extremity of their abilities, is to empower them again to have a public dialogue or some sort of public um, communication. And this is one of the last kind of examples I'm going to give um, my own context. Uh, education in libraries also is about kind of this drive-by uh, attempt to instruct around different literacies. So a program that we created at uh, Claremont that's super fun is basically take some old books that would have been thrown away or recycled, carve them into objects, and win prizes. So this is, uh, this is most definitely an art contest. But what it allows us to do is, again, have these kind of sideline conversations around um, when information is no longer quote unquote useful or uh, when, when a text actually enters a different phase of its life cycle. And, and all of this stuff I consider very much a literacy or an aspect of understanding that I think everyone should have and something that libraries have a big stake in, um, in helping people learn, no matter what kind of library you're talking about. Right, so the last couple of examples here for reals, um, I did want to talk about about one emerging platform that I think um, librarians across all types of libraries are going to have a lot of fun with and a, a lot of um, ability to use to get effect our badges. And you've got a great example in, in this MOOC. Um, as you're going through, there's a ton of different badges you yourself can earn. Um, and I think this is really an excellent way to engage particularly online learners because there can be kind of a, a sense of a disparate learning community, maybe a little bit actually a distant learning community and using badges to engage people and keep them in the learning situation with you is an excellent way to, say, incentivize a program, a learning program at your institution that doesn't necessarily end with a degree or doesn't end with our, you know, a, a tangible reward of some sort. So if you offer people badges, in this case, um, I'm showing you a badge that I developed on the fly for an immersion teaching with technology program that um, kind of debuted this summer, and I would encourage anyone who is in higher ed libraries, who wants to learn more about instructional technology, kind of check this program out. Um, it'll come around again in 2015. I think it was really successful on its first round. Now again, um, the badges in the Hyperlink Library MOOC are very much an example of, again, how to incentivize, engage, acknowledge people's learning um, with a little bit of a non-traditional focus. I think that's, uh, they're actually quite, quite well developed, and I was, I was happy to see so much happening with, um, with the hyper library badges. And I'd actually like to ask Michael at this point, um, what type of plugin or badging system have you used to develop these within this course? OK, the, the badges, and I'm glad you asked this, because I, uh, I was going to I made a note to tell you this after you, uh, you finished. The badges were developed this summer by uh, some SLIS students, mm, and Kyle Jones. And they, Kyle had a whole group of our students at San Jose um, working on different aspects of the MOOC all summer. And two of them chose the, uh, the badge area to work on. So I don't want to say the wrong thing and say something wrong about how the badges were developed. <laughs> I am so knocked out by it. And even me, coming in as one of the co-instructors, when I started doing things and I was awarded badges, sure, it might seem a little silly to get a badge for doing a blog post, but it's also kind of, you know, it does kind of encourage somebody. And if you, you do a few things, you're like, yeah, okay, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I see nothing wrong with that. I agree. I mean, I don't think it's silly at all. And um, anyone who's ever had to develop programming for the public of any sort knows that any way you can keep people with you is, um, is a good strategy. And 
even if it's like this, the couple of pixels, little picture, um, a little bit of kind of go get them champ, I, I still think it's a great strategy um, and a, a good way to encourage participation. Again, engage participation, make people feel valued, uh, which is a big part of, of instruction. Which gets me to it, the second concept, which is actually much more brief than the first one. <laughs> you might be excited to hear, which is the idea of instructional literacy. So, what do librarians and library educators need to um, be conversant with to be confident, strong, effective um, educators? No matter what your focus is in libraries, I think these are pretty much the core competencies that are important to learn about. And that book that Michael waved around um, in the beginning is basically built on these four sections. The idea of reflective practice. Reflective practice is very simply um, being aware of your own practice and impact as an educator, as a librarian, as a professional. So thinking about what you're doing, thinking about your own efficacy, working um, pretty much you know tirelessly to improve, being engaged in your work and caring about um, the outcome of your work. That, in a nutshell, is reflective practice. Very easy to do. You just stay present. <laughs> Basically, and for any of you meditators out there um, or, and or hippies like me, uh, it's a wonderful strategy to, again, um, really be more, uh, have more efficacy in your life in general. And of course, there's a lot of, of theoretical approaches to reflective practice, but in general, just, just be present, be aware, and don't stop improving. Educational theory, and that's going to be the last kind of thing I talk about in today's MOOC presentation. And these are approaches to understanding how people learn, why they learn, why it matters, and what you can do about it. Instructional technologies or teaching technologies. Now, this is just scratching the surface of a gigantic and evolving planet. Revolving, perhaps I should say. Um, so instructional tech is everything from the MOOC that you're taking right now to the pencil on your desk to pretty much anything you use to develop and deliver instruction. Now, um, there is an approach to instructional technology that uses a word called affordances that I really like. So instead of whiz-bang or you know, developing things because they're emerging and you think they could be kind of neat, you look at functionally what a tool can do um, and evaluate it kind of with brutal practicality for its suitability in a given context. And it's something when I, when I do professional development around um, instructional tech, I, I just really encourage people to look at the affordances, think about what they're going to accomplish with this tool and not who they're going to impress with it. Finally, instructional design, very close to my heart for people who um, basically think that perhaps they are skirting over some uh, useful areas when they're creating learning experiences. Instructional design is a wonderful way to work through step by step what it takes to make um, a, a piece of educational material or some sort of exchange around some sort of bit of content. Any type of education works better. This is the instructional design model that I developed for the book that I published in 2011. And this is really focused on library education. It's focused on the types of uh, experience or type of situations we find ourselves in as educators, which are often relatively limited in terms of uh, duration. They may be kind of embedded within another teaching and learning context. So you really have to be uh, good at planning quickly and executing things well and then turning around and figuring out how to revise what you've just done um, so it'll be better next time. So that's called the user method, user model, whatever you want to um, say there. And again, it's something you use to remind yourself, like any instructional design model, um, create a good mindset or a good approach to education. And last but not least, um, rounding out on the third and final concept that I wanted to talk about in um, broad brush terms today, that instructional theory or that learning theory. Um, now, OK, so I've put this graphic up. And it's actually a really wonderful um, kind of interactive graphic that you can find online by the Holistic Approach to Technology Enhanced Learning uh, folks. Now, this thing basically lays out just how complicated learning theory can be. Uh, you see close to 50 different concepts right here. They're kind of branching off from one another. They have a lot to do with one another. All of those connections and lines basically show you um, how these things have developed from one another. And if you want to go into any one in detail, you can expand out and uh, learn a lot more about the individuals and theorists behind these wonderful ideas. So much of learning theory is about um, psychology. So what motivates people to learn? Um, what helps things stick in their memory? What does their learning environment have to do with the way they take things in? And finally, 
Um, what did they know before they came into a learning situation? Now, these are the four kind of pillars of, of knowledge or understanding or learning that, that I really encourage people to think about. Now, motivation, I think, is really key for library educators because if we're coming in sometimes from the side, if we're asking people to voluntarily um, learn something or engage in something library-wise, uh, you got to think about their motivation. What are you doing to interest them? What are you doing to keep them engaged? This comes back to badges. Um, again, understanding that, that user, that learner, and speaking directly to um, their own learner motivation. Now, I wanted to take uh, just about 20 seconds to give a super fast overview of the main learning theories out there. Now, each of these I find very interesting, and they kind of developed in sequence. So, over the 20th century, you had uh, kind of the beginning of psychology that was kind of based on observation. And you see that little drooling dog over there in the corner. Um, this is not a picture of Michael's dog, even though you can see it kind of wandering around in the background. Um, but same principle, still a dog. So behaviorism is, is kind of the tried and true, sitting in elementary school at rows of desks, reciting the, um, the multiplication tables kind of approach to education. It's actually quite effective and really fundamental to how people learn through repetition, by being acknowledged and kind of reinforced uh, through praise or, you know, with a knuckles wrapped by a ruler kind of thing. So um, you're, you're, you're taking a very kind of behavioral psychological approach to instruction with that. So that developed into cognitive instruction, which was much more focused on how the brain worked. Um, so again, how much information can people take in? This is uh, basically a reflection of how the uh, tools and methods for investigating the human brain developed um, over the course of time. So when in the beginning all you could do is watch the dog drool, and now you can hook them up to a whole bunch of computers and monitor his brain activity. So cognitive education is where instructional design comes from. The idea that if you create things that are sequenced appropriately and don't contain too much or too little information, that people are going to stay with you for longer. Now, um, around the 50s and 60s, people started to take issue with the complete lack of um, kind of focus on personality, environment, affect, um, all sorts of kind of social privilege, class privilege, uh, basically thinking that cognitivism was education without context. So constructivism is a much more progressive, I think, theory of learning that developed um, kind of in, in response to the clinical focus of cognitivism. And it's very much still in vogue um, in all sorts of education. I would say it's pretty much a blend of cognitivist and constructivist techniques now um, in, in kind of uh, across the board. And finally, we have connectivism, which is a, actually quite a small um, in terms of like niche theory, but I think that it's something that library educators can learn a lot from. This is a guy who basically, and I'm kind of blanking on his name, I'm sorry to say, uh, developed a, a kind of a, a theory that says because the context of information and the structure of information is changing, the way that we learn itself is changing. So the way that we attempt to find knowledge, the way that we build knowledge is changing basically because um, information architecture is so fundamentally different than it was in the past. I find that very, very interesting and I think that it uh, very much confirms a lot of the emerging literacies and information literacy uh, that Michael will be talking about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to round out the learning theory section with a couple of um, theorists or ideas that are very close to my heart. These are um, a couple of alternative approaches, I would say, to major learning theories. Now, over there on the left, we have um, the genius, wonderful educator, Bell Hooks, who basically is a great example of the idea of critical and feminist pedagogy. And in libraries, there's a lot of great work happening right now around critical and feminist pedagogy. A couple of uh, people that are really shining in this area are Maria Accardi, Emily Dubinsky, Alana Kumbier. They have a couple of books out through Library Juice Press that I would highly recommend you looking into. Now, this is um, a type of instruction or pedagogy that really challenges people to think about power and privilege and um, all those sorts of things that uh, kind of shape our experiences in society and culture, race, class, sexuality, um, gender, all of the different things that again condition how we move through the world and how that ex affects our experiences as, as learners. Um, also, and this is a, a kind of theorist or concept that Michael uses a lot in his own um, classes. I, I know this um, by experience. Transformative learning is an approach to understanding how adults um, really build meaning in their lives and how adults learn. And, you know, basically approaches to how to change understanding in um, older or adult learners. And a guy named Jack Mazzaro, it's a great example 
of that approach, I think, very useful for um, librarians who are in educational context. So that was my MOOC lecture, la di da. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And again, that was some broad brush stuff, but I hope that you're taking away some ideas um, and potential resources that you can follow up on that um, kind of get at this fundamental, this core idea that libraries have always been and will continue to be learning organizations, both learning about things internally and then helping people learn externally uh, and the communication that happens between those two ideas. And then librarians um, as learning facilitators, developing new methods and new ways of doing this all the time and very interesting work happening out there. And I'm sure that some of the people who are watching this right now are um, on top of that interesting work. And I encourage you to continue with it. So closing with a quote from my um, personal philosopher boyfriend, John Dewey, education is a social process. Education is growth. Um, education is not a preparation for life. Education is life. And I think that's a wonderful um, kind of approach to pretty much all work and all learning and all things. Um, figuring out how to learn in community and learn in a way that continues your own development as human being and as a professional. So with that um, preachy uh, kind of um, pulpit thumping thing at the end there, I am going to round it out. And if you have any interest in um, looking at my other presentations or anything like that, uh, you can go to slideshare.net slash charbooth. And I also have a blog called informational.com. Um, note the absence of the R in informational. And I go into a lot more detail about some of the programs that I was talking about today if you want to learn anything else. So I am now going to stop sharing my screen and return to the embodied world so I can talk to Michael. All right. Hey. Yeah. Okay. I'll pull the camera back. I'll pull the camera back for just a second, but we're going to get it back on you. Thank you so much for that. I was sort of uh, enthralled listening to you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate how you you just hit all the perfect notes that that I want to convey with this module in the MOOC as well as uh, uh, in the the classes that I teach. I made some notes, and this is I don't have any specific questions, but I just made some notes. I want to respond to a couple things and then maybe if you want to say a couple of words and I'm watching the time so we might after that wind up. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. So um, I've been uh, doing sort of a new-ish presentation called Learning Everywhere of late and listening to you it kind of, you know how when you hear someone you really respect you uh, talk about some of the similar themes that made me happy that, that I'm sort of on the right path and this whole concept of learning everywhere to me means that uh, libraries can facilitate, libraries and librarians can facilitate learning across a broad spectrum of many different channels, many different ways, inside the building, in the palm of your hand, all those different things that we're talking about right now. And you said uh, to enable people to teach themselves, and I think that's something we need to remember uh, more, I think we need to remember that a lot because it's very easy to fall into the I'm going to teach a class at the public library mold and it's just somebody talking at a bunch of people and then sending them right. out the door. So, um, and helping people find their own path and that's when I made my first little uh, Mesero note because I really think that kind of speaks to transformative learning to help people find their way forward in their lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful the way you phrase that. And then specifically for librarians and this is very important and I'm so glad you said it and this seriously this we want to go out to all the folks that are participating in this course is a way to think about going forward in their own professional practice is to be flexible practical and to have that moxie that you spoke about so important and thank you for the the Brian's post as well mm -hmm. um, just if you're a librarian and you're you're watching this recording and you have said this has come out of your mouth that's not my job there's a problem because okay. there's probably some better things to say before you say that's not my job uh, and to maybe get you to you know think about how your job might be changing uh, so absolutely thank you for saying that as well uh, I'm excited to see your study that you talked about uh, soon to be published and we will share that with the MOOC folks who will be with us um, through the end of November yeah. and thank you for your words about badges um, which and I guess we talked a little bit about that. So those were the things that I wrote down. I just really appreciate the way you framed everything. Um, what the what I would sort of ask or just kind of throw back to you is, um, we we came into this project, 
as a way to see if we could offer a large scale social interactive collaborative learning environment you know it's not just like 10 lectures by me or by Kyle you know talking at everybody then saying you know go away and write something we really want want some interaction and I I'm hoping, believing that this is a way forward for professional development, for large-scale professional development uh, in libraries, for library staff, for folks that, that work in libraries. This is sort of, and I've written about this, is like Learning 2.0 meets an even bigger scale, which Learning right. 2.0 very success, successful globally. So this, to me, is the next step. Do you want to take just a minute or two and talk about that, and then we'll uh, wind up? Sure, and I think, you know, I have a couple of thoughts about um, designing for large-scale kind of online social learning. It, I think, may be the most challenging thing I've ever done, personally, um, and I bet you can relate to this, Michael. In order for it to work, people have to be um, very much motivated, very much um, interested and engaged in learning in that kind of context, in building a professional community, in, um, again, autodidacting, in, in building a skill set. So I think that in order for that to work on a large scale, that individuals and institutions have to both incentivize and help people develop that, um, that kind of personal affect, that personal interest, that personal transformative um, kind of approach to their own career and the work that they do. Now, um, that is really, I would say, 75% of the battle of making all of this work and more interesting and making one's livelihood that much more enjoyable. So, um, you've got a lot of people who have the opportunity to develop these learning um, experiences, and believe me, it takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And I think that the emotional demands <laughs> of online instruction are hugely taxing in a way. Um, and th th it's very important yes. that the educator ha is, is a very engaging person, has um, a very um, energetic teaching persona, and that they do not... Um, just rely on that energetic teaching persona to vomit content at their community and then expect that to be sufficient in some way. Right. You're saying that that the the ideal end result of these learning exper experiences is, is really self-empowerment. It's not about you sharing your expertise. It's about people working together to build a more diverse and a more holistic understanding of the work that they do in the profession and to catalyze ideas together. And that emerging teaching with technology program that I just got done teaching, after I slept for like two months straight, um, I, I basically reflected on how much incredible connection had been built between the learners and the people in these cohorts. It wasn't about me or Tiffany Travis or whoever else delivered the program. It was about basically building a sort of, um, I think the word incubator is overused, uh, a Petri dish. You know, for people to, to kind of grow uh, together, if you will. It's kind of a disturbing image, but um, you're providing the conditions for people to improve and learn and, and become something else, right? So I, I think that um, it's kind of interesting as it might be to think about something as banal as professional development. It's, it's not banal, right? It's not banal at all. It's the work that we do, and I think librarians are very much um, emotionally connected to the work and kind of called to this work as though we were called um, to something absolutely. else. Like it's not, it's not that you just fall into. Maybe, maybe some people fall into it, but we fall into it because we care about intellectual freedom. We care about um, making sure that people are able to learn and preserve the ability to be self-empowered learners and, and to be kind of engaged in their community, engaged in the community of the practice. So I don't know. It's it's hard to be detached when you're in a profession that is so self self-selectingly, um, I'm going to say it, ad, ad, advocacy activist oriented. So use that mm -hmm. use that motivation to keep yourself learning and to, to build the types of experiences that privilege kind of the that kind of like spark of empowerment that we can all have inside. Um, and that's my critical pedagogy speaking right there. Um, and it's very important, I think, again, to challenge the idea of, of expertise and those learning experiences and make sure that people um, have just as much agency and just as much voice as you do as, as an instructor. Because otherwise they feel like bored, you know? Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's all I've got for you. Nice. I, I 
uh, tell all people I, the presentation I do. I I say I I think we came to this profession because we want to bring our hearts with us. Yeah, and I agree. For sure, if we're going to if we're going to teach, uh, we need to do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Well, yeah, I, because I, oh, just last yeah, thing. I'm always yeah, like right. busting in at the end. Um, it takes a lot of energy to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um. And so you've got to have something that you can keep using to feed the fire, right? Because otherwise you'll burn out. So think about what keeps you um, keeps you on fire, right? Absolutely, okay. yeah, absolutely. Char, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Super fun. This is great, and this is going to go out uh, for the world and uh, for the folks in the MOOC, and I just really appreciate the time that you spent and how eloquently you, you uh, made your points. So thank you, everyone, in the Hyperlink Library MOOC. Thank you. This will be for learning and new literacies, and we will see you on the course site. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye, y'all. Take care. Thank you.